The Revolt of the Evil Fairies by Ted Poston The grand dramatic offering of the Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School was the biggest event of the year in our social life in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. It was the one occasion on which they let us use the old Cooper Opera House. And even some of the white folks came out yearly to applaud our presentation. The first two rows of the orchestra were always reserved for our white friends, and our leading colored citizens sat right behind them, with an empty row intervening, of course. Mr. Ed Smith, our local undertaker, invariably occupied a box to the left of the house and wore his cutaway coat and striped breeches. This distinctive garb was usually reserved for those rare occasions when he officiated at the funerals of our most prominent colored citizens. Mr. Thaddeus Long, our colored mailman, once rented a tuxedo and bought a box too, but nobody paid him much mind. We knew he was just showing off. The title of our play never varied. It was always Prince Charming and the Sleeping Beauty, but no two presentations were ever the same. Miss H. Bell Laprade, our sixth grade teacher, rewrote the script every season, and it was never like anything you read in the storybooks. Miss Laprade called it a modern morality play of conflict between the forces of good and evil. And the forces of evil, of course, always came off second best. The Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School was in a state of ferment from Christmas until February, for this was the period when parts were assigned. First, there was a selection of the good fairies and the evil fairies. This was very important, because the good fairies wore white costumes and the evil fairies black. And strangely enough, most of the good fairies usually turned out to be extremely light in complexion with straight hair and white folks' features. On rare occasions, a dark-skinned girl might be lucky enough to be a good fairy, but not one with a speaking part. There never was any doubt about Prince Charming and the Sleeping Beauty. They were always light-skinned. And though nobody ever discussed those things openly, it was an accepted fact that a lack of pigmentation was a decided advantage in the Prince Charming and Sleeping Beauty sweepstakes. And therein lay my personal tragedy. I made the best grades in my class. I was the leading debater and the scion of a respected family in the community. But I could never be Prince Charming because I was black. In fact, every year when they started casting our grand dramatic offering, my family started pricing black cheesecloth at Franklin's department store, for they knew that I would be leading the forces of darkness and skulking back in the shadows, waiting to be vanquished in the third act. And Mama had experience with this sort of thing. All my brothers had finished Booker T. before me. Not that I was alone in my disappointment. Many of my classmates felt it, too. I probably just took it more to heart. Rat Jointer, for instance, could rationalize the situation. Rat was not only black, he lived on Billy Goat Hill. But Rat summed it up like this. If you black, you black. I should have been able to regard the matter calmly, too, for our grand dramatic offering was only a reflection of our daily community life in Hopkinsville. The Allers had the best of everything. They held most of the teaching jobs in Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School. They were the Negro doctors, the lawyers, the insurance men. They even had a blue vein society. And if your dark skin obscured your throbbing pulse, you were hardly a member of the elite. Yet I was inconsolable the first time they turned me down for Prince Charming. That was the year they picked Roger Jackson. Roger was not only dumb, he stuttered. But he was light enough to pass for white, and that was apparently sufficient. In all fairness, however, it must be admitted that Roger had other qualifications. His father owned the only colored saloon in town and was quite a power in local politics. In fact, Mr. Clinton Jackson had a lot to say about just who taught in the Booker T. Washington Colored Grammar School. So it was understandable that Roger should have been picked for Prince Charming. My real heartbreak, however, came the year they picked Sarah Williams for Sleeping Beauty. She had soft light hair, bluish gray eyes, and a dimple which stayed in her left cheek whether she was smiling or not. 
Of course, Sarah never encouraged me much. She never answered any of my fervent love letters, and Rat was very scornful of my one-sided love affairs. As long as she don't call you a black baboon, you'll keep on hanging around. After Sarah was chosen for Sleeping Beauty, I went out for the Prince Charming role with all my heart. If I had to claim boldly in previous contests, oh, I was matchless now. If I had bothered Mama with rehearsals at home before, I pestered her to death this time. Yes, and I purloined my sister's can of Palmer's skin success. I knew the prince's role from start to finish, having played the head evil fairy opposite it for two seasons. And Prince Charming was one character whose lines Miss Leprade never varied much in her many versions. But although I never admitted it, even to myself, I knew I was doomed from the start. They gave the part to Leonardius Wright. Leonardius, of course, was Yaller. The teacher sensed my resentment. They were almost apologetic. They pointed out that I had been such a splendid head evil fairy for two seasons that it would be a crime to let anybody else try the role. They reminded me that Mama wouldn't have to buy any more cheesecloth because I could use my same old costume. They insisted that the head evil fairy was even more important than Prince Charming because he was the one who cast the spell on Sleeping Beauty. So what could I do but accept? I had never liked Leonardius Wright. He was a goody-goody, and even Mama was always throwing him up to me. But above all, he too was in love with Sarah Williams. And now he got a chance to kiss Sarah every day in rehearsing the awakening scene. Well, the show must go on, even for little black boys. So I threw my soul into my part and made the head evil fairy a character to be remembered. When I drew back from the couch of Sleeping Beauty and slunk away into the shadows at the approach of Prince Charming, my facial expression was indeed something to behold. When I was vanquished by the shining sword of Prince Charming in the last act, I was a little hammy, perhaps, but terrific. The attendance at our grand dramatic offering that year was the best in its history. Even the white folks overflowed the two rows reserved for them, and a few were forced to sit in the intervening one. This created a delicate situation, but everybody tactfully ignored it. When the curtain went up on the last act, the audience was in fine fettle. Everything had gone well for me, too except for one spot in the second act. That was where Leonardius unexpectedly wrapped me over the head with his sword as I slunk off into the shadows. That was not in the script, but Miss Leprade quieted me down by saying, Shh, it made a nice touch. Rat said, Leonardus did it on purpose. The third act went on smoothly, though, until we came to the vanquishing scene. That was where I slunk from the shadows for the last time and challenged Prince Charming to mortal combat. The hero reached for his shining sword, a bit unsportsmanlike, I always thought, since Miss Leprade consistently left the head evil fairy unarmed, and then it happened. Later I protested loudly, but in vain, that it was a case of self-defense. I pointed out that Leonardius had a mean look in his eye, I cited the impromptu rapping he had given my head in the second act, but nobody would listen. They just wouldn't believe that Leonardius really intended to brain me when he reached for his sword. Anyway, he didn't succeed. For the minute I saw that evil gleam in his eye, or was it my own? I cut loose with a right to the chin, and Prince Charming dropped his shining sword and staggered back. His astonishment lasted only a minute, though for he lowered his head and came charging in, fists flailing. There was nothing yellow about Leonardius but his skin. The audience thought the scrap was something new Miss Leprade had written in. They might have kept on thinking so if Miss Leprade hadn't boy, been screaming boy, so hysterically from boy, the sidelines. Sit it down! Stop it! Boy, stop it! Boys, stop it! You better stop that now! And the Grat Joiner hadn't decided stop that it. this was stop as good a time it. as any to settle Boys. old scores. Stop it. So he turned around stop and took a it. sock at the male good fairy nearest him. 
When the curtain rang down, the forces of good and evil were locked in combat, and Sleeping Beauty was wide awake and streaking for the wings. They rang the curtain back up 15 minutes later, and we finished the play. I lay down and expired according to specifications. But Prince Charming will probably remember my sneering corpse to his dying day. They wouldn't let me appear in the grand dramatic offering at all the next year. But I didn't care. I couldn't have been Prince Charming anyway. 